What if you could experience Christianity the way the apostles did in the first century? This is one of the questions that Pentecostals are asking. How could we move back to the first century ideal to experience what we see on the pages of the book of Acts? This movement, as you read about in Spittler's chapter in the Five Views on Christian Spirituality, it emerged around 1900. Formally, it's coming down to us from the Wesleyan holiness tradition, but in the years leading up to the rise of Pentecostalism, the Bible was denied and attacked by those who espoused German higher criticism, those who denied the Scripture's inspiration. Protestant liberalism in the United States, which you'll learn about in church history too, was built on an evolutionary understanding of the world and the notion that Scripture merely contains a record of human experience of God rather than God's personal revelation of who He is and what He calls us to do. Within Protestant circles, the Methodist, that is Wesleyan movements, and the Keswick Higher Life movements spoke about victory over sin and victory over temptation through a second stage of Christianity after conversion. R.A. Torrey, that is Reuben Archer Torrey, and Dwight L. Moody both championed the reception of the Spirit as an empowering presence for the work of evangelism and missions in the world. In 1900 then, the Bethel Bible School in Topeka, Kansas, pictured in the bottom right of the screen, there was a prayer meeting under the leadership of the school's principal, Charles Fox Parham, a former Methodist minister, where the students at that school prayed during three-hour watches in the night in a ceaseless intercession. They had come to be convinced that the baptism of the Holy Spirit that belonged to the first century could occur with them as well, and that God might answer their prayer to baptize them with the Spirit and would show that He had done so by helping them to speak in tongues. On January the 1st, 1901, they claimed that the Holy Spirit fell on one of the students and was evidenced by speaking in tongues. Charles Fox Parham then became the one who promoted this view of the baptism of the Spirit and of the student's hermeneutic whereby they said, when we read the account of Pentecost in Acts 2, we see this not as a unique event, but it's something which all Christians are to experience. Parham took that message to Missouri and spread it there and then on to Houston, Texas. And while he was in Houston, Texas, a black man named William Seymour, you see him on the left side of the screen, received Parham's apostolic faith message. Apostolic faith, you'll see this in denominational language sometimes. It's apostolic because it's supposed to be more primitive, more like the first century Christianity. Seymour took this view of Christianity, of the baptism of the Spirit leading to tongue speaking to Los Angeles, California. And on April the 9th, 1906, Seymour and seven others claimed to have received spirit baptism evidenced by speaking in tongues. This display erupted in what was called the Azusa Street Prayer Revival at an abandoned Methodist church for several years following. By 1908, this Pentecostal or apostolic faith movement was being reported in over 50 nations having spread from its initial home in Topeka, Kansas. Through what they called baptism with the Holy Spirit, it was a revival of tongue speaking. That is, they argued this tongue speaking, according to Stanley Horton, was speaking a language which one has not studied, but which is identifiable. The influence of these early events at Topeka, Kansas and the Azusa Street Prayer Revival resulted in the conflation or the assimilation of tongue speaking from this Pentecostal stream now that erupted in 1906 tongue-speaking people who affirm this kind of primitive apostolic Christianity into all the other denominations in the United States and elsewhere. But in many of the denominations, they could not handle this emergence of uh, spirit baptism evidenced in tongue-speaking, and so new denominations were formed. By 1932, the Pentecostal denominations had really come into existence. They've emerged. Assemblies of God, Christian Missionary Alliance, the Church of the Nazarene, uh, the Church of God. They they are on the scene. Uh, A.W. Tozer, you know, is going to come out of the Christian Missionary Alliance by the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. And as you move forward, 1948, Oral Roberts becomes well known. He eventually founds Oral Roberts University, well known for healing ministry, so claimed. And Oral Roberts in the 1940s was an evangelist, but he's also with that ministry speaking about 
an ongoing gift of healing in the church today, verifying the truthfulness of his message was the way he would put it. In the 1960s, we have what is now well known in movie form as the Jesus Revolution. It is the second wave of Pentecostalism, and people like Chuck Smith in Southern California found Calvary Chapel. Lonnie Frisbee, who eventually moves to Florida, was initially part of that work. Greg Laurie, as you know from the movie, is saved under the ministries there in Southern California. And this second wave, Jesus Revolution of Pentecostalism, is at work, it is a revival movement of sorts among hippies. Hippies who are already pushing against cultural norms as far as the culture more generally. Well, those hippies, when they become Christians, push against some of the cultural norms that would be associated with Christianity. So rather than hymnody, let's sing contemporary Christian music. It gets its start in this period. By the time you get to 1981, Peter Wagner is on the scene. And this is what is known as third wave evangelicalism. Peter Wagner became a professor at Fuller Theological Seminary, and he is well known for power evangelism, where he is teaching that an ongoing gift of healing, the sign gift from the apostolic era, can and should accompany the preaching of the gospel to verify that the gospel is indeed bona fide, a revelation from God, the saving message and promise of salvation. There are others who pick up on that theme. You have the fact that Oral Roberts University starts teaching classes as well as Fuller Theological Seminary on power evangelism and how one can lead others to uh, learn how to do these miracles that accompany the preaching of the gospel. You have vineyard songs and the vineyard kind of scripture songs emerge in this time of the third wave of Pentecostalism. So it's third wave Pentecostalism, but it's noted more fully as third wave charismatic theology. Third wave charismatics who are softer on the need to speak in tongues as an initial sign of being baptized by the Spirit, but they are Pentecostal overall in their theology because they still hold to a two-stage view of Christianity. One is converted first and then has this later full-orbed, more at least fuller experience of the Holy Spirit. They speak about terms of renewal and fullness. They speak in terms of revival, and they're always looking for that. And so you have in the third wave charismatic or third wave evangelical movement that emerges in the 1980s, a stream of Christians who are still affirming the continuation of the sign gifts like Pentecostals had done, but not necessarily emphasizing tongues as much. Oftentimes they're emphasizing prophecy. Now, there come then these different streams in the charismatic view. There's a diversity of streams, and some in the reform side of the charismatic movement would be like Sam Storms on the right or Matt Chandler on the left. And they speak, maybe even more often than tongues, of an ongoing gift of prophecy, a word from God, a word of wisdom, a word of knowledge. A word that would be argued, especially by Uh, Wayne Grudem in his systematic theology made most well-known and given the highest academic credentials by Grudem. He argued in a Cambridge dissertation on 1 Corinthians 12 through 14 that the gift of prophecy in the New Testament doesn't have to be infallible like the Old Testament. The gift of prophecy in the New Testament can be wrong. It can be evaluated, test everything, hold fast to what is good, 1 Thessalonians said. The gift of prophecy in the New Testament should be evaluated by Scripture. It's subservient to Scripture. It's not on par with the revelation of Scripture. Matt Chandler, Sam Storms, John Piper would affirm this kind of a view. Sovereign Grace Ministries with Bob Coughlin and C.J. Mahaney. And then you also have uh, J. Rodman Williams, the Presbyterian Charismatic. Well, charismatic theology in this sense is upholding a strong doctrine of sola scriptura and a strong doctrine of the Reformation solas, salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, for the glory of God alone, under the supreme authority of scripture alone, and it's reformed in its overall soteriology. There's a whole other stream, though. There's, there are charismatics from the Arminian stream, which the Assemblies of God represent this view. Larry Hart, who writes in The Five Views on Spirit Baptism, edited by Chad Owen Brand, he is clearly, with the Assemblies of God, clearly orthodox, clearly gospel-believing brothers and sisters here. When we're speaking about these kind of Arminian charismatics, 
We are speaking of those who have a high view of Scripture. It is true and authoritative. They are Trinitarian. They're speaking the same Reformation Protestant doctrines of the solos of the Reformation. And so we want to affirm these wherever they may be found in charismatic denominations such as Assemblies of God or charismatic theology holders, those who hold to continuing sign and apostolic gifts in various denominations as brothers and sisters in Christ. At the same time, there are those associated with the charismatic movement who do teach aberrant, heretical, false doctrines. There are some such as Kenneth Copeland and Gloria Copeland on the right who have a strong name it, claim it, word of faith kind of theology that comes more out of new thought and the power of positive thinking from the 20th century than it does anything in the Bible. It treats many things in the Bible as supposed promises which one can positively confess. One can name it and claim it and alter reality. Kenneth Copeland is well known for us multiple stories about rebuking a storm and telling it to go away. And he claims to be able to speak, and if he believes enough, to claim a promise and in Jesus' name to make something happen, to alter reality. There's another aberrant teaching associated with this movement, the healing in the atonement phenomenon associated with Pentecostals and Charismatics is, in my view, quite uh, opposed to the teaching of the New Testament, where it claims this. It presents the healing that Christ brought in the atonement as being also physical and in this life. By his stripes we are healed, they will say. And the book on the left by Ken Hagen would be one such example where I would argue by his stripes we are healed and the healing that comes in the atonement of Jesus is, mainly speaking, of an already reality of reconciliation with a holy God. We are sinful, and by Jesus Christ, through faith in Him, we can be reconciled to a holy God, not under the wrath of God any longer, but not guilty, but righteous instead, God declares us, when we are justified through faith in Jesus Christ, and definitively sanctified, and then ongoingly conformed to the image of Jesus as we await the return of Christ or going to heaven. But the, this view, the aberrant teaching, would argue that God not only intends to heal you internally, He is also intending to heal you physically and externally. They'll point to healing miracles of Jesus and assume that Jesus healed every person that came along, when in fact there are many in the New Testament that He did not heal. They will speak of people needing to believe sufficiently, and if they will believe sufficiently, Christ's blood not only covers their sin and cleanses them, but it provides healing for cancer, healing for their diseases. Thereby, if you're not healed, it's often because your faith is lacking. The truth is that Scripture does not say that one is healed in this life of all their physical ailments. Rather, Jesus came to give a foretaste of the inbreaking kingdom of God by the miracles that He did, by the healing signs. But He didn't heal everyone. But it was to give us a foreshadowing of the new heavens and new earth when everyone who is in Christ will receive new resurrection bodies that will never die again, will never get sick, will never wear out. Power evangelism took on a whole new um, kind of healing element, so-called, with people like Todd White and Benny Hinn, which I would say is also associated very much with aberrant teachings within the Pentecostal and then charismatic stream. Todd White is known to have drop-kicked different people in an action that is uh, garnering attention, very showy, to say that a person is healed. He will declare them healed. There have been all kinds of scandal associated with Todd White and his ministry. There are others such as Benny Hinn who have been associated with very similar things, televangelist on TBN and the like. And so this charismatic stream does not only have the Reformed and the Arminian side that are very much tied to Scripture, it also has these aberrant teachings. The prosperity gospel, I haven't even mentioned, would be supreme among them. Teaching people that your ultimate problem is not reconciliation with God, a holy God, in your sin through Jesus Christ, but your, your ultimate problems are being fixed by having your best life now, by having... You know, if you believe in Jesus enough, if you give to the ministries of certain people, then you can have your best life in this life. God wants you healthy, wealthy, and happy. That's the promise of the gospel and the prosperity gospel. Well, that is an aberrant teaching. It is heretical. It goes against the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
So what we have in the Pentecostal movement is much to be appreciated in terms of trying to present to us the notion of revival. And can we be as much as possible in this new covenant age like the New Testament church? Can we aim for and rely on the presence and power of the Holy Spirit in our lives? And yet, there are many things also, as we've just mentioned, to be uh, cautioned against, to be watched out for, and to be avoided. We want to commend our brothers and sisters who hold fast to the Scripture and to the Gospel, and we want to avoid those aberrant teachings by which, if we gain them, if we upheld them, we would forfeit our souls.